Hi all, thank you for uh, joining us to this uh, webinar discussing the issue of uh, modeling and simulation in civil engineering mega projects, led by me, Yehuda Sofir, and my colleague, uh, Judy Pisan. Uh, this is not a uh, kind of uh, how to do a Monte Carlo simulation, but uh, rather how to efficiently use the Monte Carlo simulation into, so to harness it to the uh, integrated process of decision-making within organization and try to create a value for this organization. And we will show you uh, what has been done in these regards. So let's begin. Uh, Judith, a few words about yourself. Sure. Hi, I'm Judith. Um, I work alongside Yehuda as a risk management consultant and a bid manager. I am experienced in the field of procurement and contracting and tendering in the Israeli public sector. Uh, after fulfilling few roles there as um, head of procurement for the LRT company in Tel Aviv, and also as a procurement uh, manager for the electrification project for Israel Railways. I'm MBA graduate and PMP certified. And as of myself, I'm a risk management for 12 years, an expert in the civil engineering, construction and process industry, um, and uh, managing for the private sector, the tenders and bid, large scale tenders and bid, usually um, PPP, TFI, and BOT uh, tenders, large scale tenders with Judith. I'm in the arena of the uh, civil engineering projects, managing projects for 30 years. I'm, I was graduated as a mechanical engineer, certified as a PMP and RMP. And two years ago, I was uh, certified by the uh, well, Honor colleague, Alex Dali, for the eyes of 31,000 uh, certification. Now, from now on, now and on, we are going to close our uh, cameras and you will be able to see us again at the end of uh, this webinar, but you will see our uh, uh, icon as well. So let's go on. A few words about uh, the background regarding uh, transportation projects in Israel. Judith? Yes, so um, the investment in uh, public transportation in Israel is not considered very high, well, at least not very high as it should be. However, we are witnessing in the past uh, two decades massive investment in this uh, sector, both in the roads field, which always has been traditionally more significant, but more remarkably in the public transportation, such as rail, LRT, and metro. Just to name a few uh, notable um, projects, uh, the conclusion of uh, Jerusalem and Tel Aviv by rail uh, has just been, it just has been concluded a few months ago. Uh, the ongoing project for the electrification of the national rail network, those two projects are totaling at 6 billion euros. Three LRT lines are currently uh, being constructed in Tel Aviv with additional four LRT lines in other major cities in Israel. They are totaling at the investment of 30, around 30 billion euros and unarguably the most challenging and ambitious project, upcoming project uh, that will be probably starting at the end of this, uh, uh, this decade is the planning and the, and the construction for uh, three uh, uh, metro line, three under metro lines uh, in Tel Aviv at an investment of approximately, just to begin with, 40 billion euros. So this massive investment has, has no doubt also changed the, um, the means for uh, strategic sourcing and procurement and tendering uh, in the past years. If in the past we have seen more investment coming from the public sector via more traditional contracting methods, such as design, bid, build, or DB, design, build projects, now we are talking about more and more joint ventures between the public and the private sector, such as PPP and BOT projects, sharing both financing cost and risk with the, with the private sector. That being said, of course, um, including the fact that these projects are mostly done already in a dense and urban environment, they require extensive interface management with other projects and existing infrastructure. And this makes the 
risk management process even more paramount. But even that uh, said, even that said, um, um, the, we, we, should, we should expect that this process should be at the heart or at the core of the project. Usually the tendencies of the participants are, are such. If, it's, if it is not required, forget about it. We will not do it. Just let us do our work and leave us alone. If it is required, then let's do it as quickly as possible. Let's get it done with so we can go on with our business. Of course, these are generalized statements and there are some exclusions and we can also see some progress in the positive change in this area as we will discuss later. So who are the main key players here? We have on one side the MOF, the Ministry of Finance, who is budgeting uh, uh, the projects. We have the Ministry of Transportation who is setting the requirements and goals. We have the auditing fir firm, which is the long arm, the, prof uh, the professional arm of the MOF and the MOT. And they provide us with a report, the RFT report. They're ready for tender report, whether the tender is ready or not. And finally, we have the performing entity, which is a governmental entity uh, usually uh, either a full government, uh, fully owned governmental entity or half owned that is um, in charge of performing the, um, the, the project via project management and other contractor, obviously, but they are performing the project. They are tendering the project. And um, together we have this uh, set of players that uh, play together in this arena. So I'm going to present with you uh, the projects that we uh, have done Monte Carlo simulation on. Um, we have project A, which is, I would say, the most fascinating and interesting one that we, we had in the, in the past few months. Uh, and it is comprised, it's a portfolio of projects comprised of 10 sub projects. Some are hydrological, some are roads, some are rail, and they are all intended to solve a transportation bottleneck problem in one of Israel's main corridors. In this case, we were required to perform a high level contingency analysis due to the fact that not all projects were developed to the same stage, but we did require to uh, to do a quick analysis before drilling down to the sub-projects. Project B is a rail project, is the Eastern Rail in, uh, in Israel. But uh, Project B3, which we, we performed the Monte Carlo analysis on, is uh, one section of that rail. And Project C is an interchange in Israel. It's a road interchange and it's a standalone project. So having that said, let's dive to the processes uh, regarding the Monte Carlo simulation. The first thing to do is to uh, search for literature to support our analysis. Out of many researchers that we, we read and uh, looked for, there are two main uh, books that uh, I think we should uh, emphasize. One is the best booklet written by Professor Bennett Flyberg from Sweden. I think it's from Sweden. Mega Project and Risk, Anatomy of Ambition. It deals with transportation project based on research, huge amount of insight, huge amount of explanations regarding cost overruns, what are the root causes, what are the conclusions, who are the contributors, where does it come from? And on the right side, you can see the risk analysis written by our honored colleague, the David Rose, a quantitative guide everything that one should know about how to quantify risk using modeling, insight strategies, approaches, how to write reports, how to use the different distribution, an excellent book that has been used by us uh, to its depth. Um, two diagrams taken out from this uh, wonderful booklet of uh, Bennett Fly Professor Bennett Flyberg, one deals with the uh, issue of the difference between type of projects uh, regarding overruns, meaning that for rail, you can clearly see that the overruns go somewhere be 
between 0 to 120, while fixed links goes slightly lighter, and roads are considered to be the least uh, over, uh, prone to over, over, overruns, cost overruns. In the right hand, you can see a diagram uh, demonstrating that we are not doing, we are not improving over the years. We are not doing any better. Moreover, it might be that we are doing worse in regards to overruns, and this book definitely describes why this has happened and why there is such a huge amount of overruns. Let's take on account that 120 is twice as much as the original cost of the projects in terms of their rail projects. As uh, Judith said before, Project BNC were kind of a straightforward single project. Uh, we've been asked to do a thorough analysis and we've been using the traditional model. And this is, will begin the, our, our next uh, paragraph. Project A will be discussed uh, separately into depth. I'm using this simple sketch to uh, make you understand what is our approach regarding problems versus risk. If this is the start point of the project, this is the end point of the project, we would consider risks to be those who are beyond the mountain, those we cannot see. Although many of my colleagues, and they are probably right, will consider problems that are not, uh, that have the kind of uncertain consequences as risk, that's okay. But our approach says these are the main risk of the transportation projects. Many of them are hidden cannot be revealed, they cannot be easily revealed, and uh, we do not have uh, much information about them. So by showing us to the, the team participant, it makes them clear what are we looking for in terms of risks. <clears throat> there are four main uh, components of base in the basic process. First of all is the identify the process in a qualitative manner, then price the process, the price the risks that were identified, and it's not that easy game to, uh, to, uh, to quantify or to price the risk, then analyze them with the Monte Carlo, and finally write a report. It sounds quite uh, simple, um, but if it's not supported, well supported, this whole process by um, senior management of the organization, probably we would not be able to succeed. In this case, we would like to um, to mention one of the uh, risk officers coming from the, one of the entities in Israel that we've been working with, Mrs. Adela Gvili, which have supported us, encouraged us, pushed us to the edge to uh, promote this process within the organization, gave us huge support, and without this support, we couldn't conclude this, uh, this process at all. Um, the main, the traditional approach says, let's divide the Monte Carlo simulation into uh, three parts. The first one is the known knowns, so-called the agreements, commitments, purchasing orders, arrangements, anything which has uh, the definite uh, sum or definite uh, budget, which without, with no risk around, probably if we have a purchasing order of uh, 100 euros, it will end up uh, somewhere between like a nine, 100, 102. This might not be considered as a risk, but it has some kind of a tolerance of deviations. And the known unknowns are the identified risk, a bunch of risks, let's say 20, 30, 40 risk identified risk that can be quantified. And now we have a single separate line of the unknown unknowns, which is the allocation of the reserve of money regarding those risks that couldn't be identified. And uh, we are not able to identify the lot, but we have to allocate some amount of reserve for them. We've been using the optimistic, most likely, and pessimistic uh, values, and we've been using the fair distribution. One more thing that was introduced to this uh, Monte Carlo simulation, recommended by our honored colleague, David Bose, which we were discussing this model with him, was the Jacob Bernoulli, or the better said, the Bose Bernoulli uh, <coughs> formula or function. That's to make it very simple, it says that not all the risks occur at the same time or simultaneously. So uh, we have to distinguish them randomly. So this Bernoulli, whenever introduced to each uh, risk in the, in, the, in the Monte Carlo model, 
uh, takes on account that not everything happens on uh, simultaneous basis. We've been using two main uh, tools. One is the risk mapping. In a minute, we will elaborate on that. It's a kind of a generic risk mapping to assist people to raise uh, their awareness to risk. And to the right hand, we've been using the VOS model risk software, the Excel based, the most updated version with two main deliverables. One is the histogram, the well known histogram, and one is the tornado graph where, uh, where risk or sub project depend on the case that are highly impacting the histogram will pop up immediately. As for the generic risk mapping, here you can see after years of evolving this map, we can see um, categories of risk where risk may come from. These are not risk, but these are areas that risk may come from. And whenever reading this map, it, quite be, it will be quite easy to identify the risk because people are thinking through these categories and subcategories, such as external parties, site, engineering, technology, equipment, schedule issues, procurement issues, maintenance operations, startup and commissioning, financial impacts, and even the corona probably is, is somewhere here or somewhere here. Um, so this, this map was widely used by us uh, through all the process. In a minute, we will explain how was it uh, utilized. As, as for the identifying the risk, we've used the pre-mortem session, meaning all papers gathered together, not in the corona or COVID-19 uh, um, uh, period. We've been using the sticky notes, writing the risk on these sticky notes, putting them on the metrics. And by that, we can uh, conclude the, the risk of the list of risks. Uh, starting from March to 2020 and on, we've shifted uh, due to the COVID-19 um, to the uh, kind of a PDF with its sticky notes, which uh, looks to us very useful, even much more efficient than the traditional sticky notes stick on the, on the table. And from these sticky notes, we could easily produce the risk register. Judith, would you like to share with us your experience coming from the public uh, sector regarding this process, some of your insights? Yes, yeah, so um, in this respect, I think that what we have seen here is a maturity in this process, especially with recurring teams that have already done it more than once. So if it started with some hesitation and sometimes objections by the participant, now we can see more and more exception and even anticipation to the next to the next workshop. It has already happened that sometimes when we finalize the workshop, we, we can often hear from the project manager, from the schedulist, um, how eye-opening this was and how um, good it was to discuss those topics that it seems that everybody knows but never truly discuss them. Sometimes those issues are are not well accepted or uh, the, you cannot really discuss them uh, in front of the client. And, and there is now a process that, you know, it allows us to do that. And in some way, we also create um, a close, uh, intimate team of project experts who sometimes don't even know what the other colleagues are truly doing or how their issues uh, could affect or be affected by their own. One interesting research that we found uh, in the internet, the Effective Opportunity Management for Projects, by, published by, um, I think it was 2005 by David Hilson. One of the diagrams taken out from these features deals uh, this with discuss the issue of to what extent can we expect the team, uh, team project team members to identify with. Uh, David Hilson claims that uh, probably somewhere between 60 to 80 percent could be identified. We have the feeling that he's right and might be that even less than that could be identified by team members depending on their experience, their qualification, competencies, competencies and uh, their willingness to, to identify risk. How to price risk? We have four main uh, components to deal with the risk pricing. One is the contractor's overhead uh, pertains to uh, extension, cost uh, pertains to extension, if any. The second brick is, or second component is the management and design fees. 
Then we have the fixed cost, meaning the construction uh, cost uh, pertains to the risk, meaning if we have to extract more soil or some kind of um, new works that have been found to be, to be executed because of a risk was materialized, these are the fixed costs. And then, then we have the other costs, some kind of a compensation for expropriation, compensation for authorities, or even paying more money to the police in order to arrange uh, or rearrange the traffic arrangements. On the right side, uh, you may see, uh, uh, sorry, it's in Hebrew, uh, the Excel sheet that we've been using to, uh, to, um, to, to register all these, uh, all these uh, sums, all these risk uh, prices. You can see the optimistic value, the most likely value, the pessimistic value. And we have used another term, which is recurrence. How many times this risk might happen times and again during the life cycle of the project or the execution. You have here the values, you have here the short description of the risk, and all this may be introduced into the Monte Carlo simulation. To make it very simple and very short, because we want to jump to the project A, which is by which was more challenging, we have produced three scenarios, three histograms, and three tornado uh, graphs. We've been searching for the peak, the highest values of the budget, including its contingency. The range is between 20 and 80, what, where the 80 was much more of interest uh, rather than 20. We usually would not assume that the project will go lower than the budget, but higher than the budget. And we have the tornado, tornado graph, which we can clearly see what are the main risks that immediately pops up and say to us, hey, be careful about this risk. You have to uh, dig into this risk. We have to take monitoring, uh, um, monitoring measures about this risk, or you have to reassess them or change kind of a design or change the contractual measures in order to deal with that. Now let's go to the project A. As Judith said, it was much more challenging. We had 10 sub projects. The typical uh, structure of the project was, as Judith uh, previously said, Let's say cluster one was hydrological projects, cluster two roads and cluster uh, three uh, rails. Uh, on the third le level, we have the, all the sub projects beginning from one to 10. I haven't articulated all, the, all of them. Going back to uh, searching for literature to support our analysis, uh, we found a very interesting um, um, research done by our colleagues from South Africa dealing with the using Monte Carlo simulation to create a rank checklist of risk in a portfolio of railway construction projects, meaning bingo. We are right there. We don't have to invent the wheel. Uh, our best colleagues from South Africa have done a huge amount of a fantastic job. And whenever looking at their ranked risk, the checklist, we could be easily uh, say that uh, we are familiar with most, if not all, the risks that uh, were revealed or ranked by our colleagues, such as electricity supply, land acquisition, scope definition, equipment unavailable, site access, the long lead item. Everything looks very much familiar. And we've learned uh, from this um, uh, research a lot about how to deal with portfolio of project rather than a single project. What was the client uh, goal? He said to us, uh, please provide me two things. First, develop a high level contingency ways range for the whole project based on sub project within limited time frame. So we do not have any kind of months, but weeks to develop a high level contingency assessment. And the second one, one while doing so, please point out who out of these 10 sub-projects uh, might, uh, might have a major impact over the whole project. So we thought it would be wise to make kind of a risk profile for each sub-project from one to 10, one, while 10 will be the most highly uh, profiled risk uh, sub-project, and one will be the least uh, risky for a sub-project. Spread them over these cone of uncertainties. Let's say, let's take a project that is, uh, is ranked as a five in risk profile. It will have a certain range of contingency, let's say 20 to 40% contingency related to its risk profile. 
And in a minute, you will see the examples of the outcomes of our uh, work. We've been using, again, the generic risk mapping, but this time we've been using it in a bit different way. First thing to do is uh, to gather all the team members together, including all the project manager of the sub uh, projects in one room and trying to find out for each and every sub project, what is the relative weight of the category? Meaning let's say if uh, for project, sub project number three, the team have concluded that the external parties might be as of essence, we will rate it as a 30% weight. While if the commissioning and handover might be less risky for this project, we may, be, may rate it as 5%. All of these should sum to 100%. Whenever concluding it, we've shifted this map to an Excel sheet and we've distributed among the team members and we've asked them to rank the subcategories for each project, either by red, orange, or green, meaning is it a highly risky subcategory, medium risky, or low risky category? and it was quantified to figures one, two, let's say one, two, three. Having that done, we collected back all the data, huge amount of data provided by the team members in terms of Excel sheets, we've analyzed it. And we can say now we have a clear uh, vision or a clear uh, standpoint about the uh, risk profiles for each project as measured or as ranked by the team members. But it wasn't enough for us. We thought that we have to add three more parameters in order to assess the risk profile for each uh, sub-project. One of them uh, says the following, where is the project in its life cycle? Is it at the very beginning? As Judith said before, many of the projects are not similar in their, stand, in their point in the life cycle. Is it in the beginning, a preliminary or conceptual design? Is it just uh, before tendering? Is it uh, finalizing its uh, detailed design? Or might be that we have a project within uh, just started excavation or started work construction, and the profile of all the parameter for this project should be a bit different. On the right hand, you may see the same diagram that I pre previously presented, that we thought that it would be a good idea to add some kind of factor to those projects who are prone, much more prone to uh, overruns shuts of the rails, so we had another parameter. And the third parameter, the contracting strategy, I will kindly ask my colleague Judith to elaborate a bit about the impact of contracting strategy on risk profile. Judith? Yes, yeah, so the contracting strategy was another parameter we used in order to predefine the risk profile. On one hand, we have the uh, what we call DB or design build project that are considered what we say the most risky. The fact that we handed over the risk, most of the risk to the contractor does not mean that um, it will not cost the client. So the risk is still on the table. Then we have the less risky contracting method, the design bid build or what we call the bill of quantity tender where most items are detailed and quantified and on the far hand, we have the least risky, the frame agreement, where not only do we have detailed design and quantified items, but we also have a contractor who knows us and we know him. So that makes it uh, uh, much less risky. And one more thing that uh, we came to the organization and said, uh, uh, and it was highly appreciated by the organization, by, by the performing entity, is to add uh, what we call integrative component. What is the integrative component? Having said that we have 10 sub-projects, they have some kind of interfaces, interlinks, integration, and links across these sub-projects. How do we measure or how do we quantify these interfaces or interlinks between these projects? So we have built kind of a virtual sub-project, project now sub-project number 11, that would cover all these uh, links that could not be attributed to a specific project or sub-project, but yet we have to take them on account because these are kind of a risk that someone should pay for them, although it might not come from a specific sub-project. So it was highly appreciated by the uh, performing entity 
this kind of an integrated component. Then we've, been, we've started to build these scenarios, yet not introduced into the Monte Carlo. In a minute, you will see how all this stuff was introduced or embedded into the Monte Carlo, but yet we are not in the Monte Carlo phase. So we had the discussion, internal discussion. We've been playing around with the weights of the categories. As you've seen before, it might be that the category was ranked as 30. We've changed it to 20 to see the impacts or the overall impact. We've been playing around with the change of parameters as discussed previously, discussed by Judith and me, the life cycle points, the contracting strategy, as well as the type of the project. And we've been playing around with the relative weights of the matrices versus the parameters. To begin with 70% weight for the categories or for the uh, assessment of the team members, while this was 30% that we've been playing around. And then at the end, we've validated the results. Now we could easily build the risk profile ranking from one to 10 for each of these three scenarios. While you can see here, let's take a risk profile five. Let's say that we have a sub project number seven that has ranked as five. If this is the case, then uh, if it was ranked as five, the, the contingency over the budget on top of the, of the budget for scenario A will vary between 7% to 22%. Let's say if it was 100 euros, then it will be 107 to 122. In scenario B, it will be a bit higher, 9 to 26. And in the most aggressive scenario, it will be somewhere between 13 to 31 to 31%, meaning 130 to 131 uh, uh, cost euros. So having said that said, we can easily spread the sub project all over this cone of risk profile. And this was the result. You can see here 11 sub projects, including the uh, so-called virtual sub project, ranked over this uh, cone of, uh, let's say, risk profile, one to 10. We have three scenarios. Now, having that said, we can uh, introduce everything in simple Monte Carlo simulation, simple Monte Carlo analysis, 11 lines, which is, stands for 10 lines for the sub-project and added one line for the virtual project and the, the integrity component while taking on account the budget plus the, or the, 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 the second value was the uh, low value and the high value for three scenarios. And we've run the analysis. To go down to the bottom line, we got three uh, different figures by three different uh, cycles of runs. Each run or each simulation was 10,000 runs and we ran it five times. So you can see in the histogram, the columns, five different columns for each histogram. So it can be easily seen that history scenario A produces about 10% contingency scenario B, 17%, and scenario C, 19%. But it popped up immediately that for all the scenarios, the same sub-project popped up as those who should be drilled down later, those who have the most uh, impact over the whole project. Our uh, conclusion was that somewhere between 17 to 19% will be a good result to uh, describe the overall contingency needed for this mega project based on the analysis or the rough analysis that we've been doing and been describing. While 10% looks like kind of uh, too optimistic or either biased or either kind of an outlier or outstanding uh, uh, figure that we cannot rely on and we couldn't even explain or validate this figure so it was okay to say to the organization, the performing entity, somewhere between 17 to 19% will be reasonable contingency. And it is why it was accepted by the performing entity. As for the decision to be made, it is more than Monte Carlo. Taking on account what we have a tight uh, time frame to do this whole analysis, taking on account that we had the Monte Carlo uh, um, results in front of us, but there are two main other components, either the entity's approach to contingency and the organizational assets and lesson learned, meaning 
probably, or in this case, yes, the organization has its own history about uh, deviation or overruns of projects, and they should take it on account, comparing it to the Monte Carlo simulation. Moreover, it might be that uh, we can recommend on, let's say, 20% contingency, but for their own reasons, such as presentation in front of the Ministry of Finance or Ministry of Transportation or challenging the team, they might be reducing the contingency into, let's say, 15%. Is it legit legitimate? Yes, it is. Monte Carlo does not stand by itself, and the decision to be made should take on account huge amount of considerations, such as the entity's approach and organization asset, and not just the Monte Carlo simulation. This is just a recommendation. And here we come to the insights of our process. Preparation is essential and vital uh, for this process. Without detailed preparation of all the tools, all the processes, we cannot uh, make any improvisation during the process. The team members will rely on this process and will build their confidence in this process whenever it's well detailed and well explained. Participants, selecting the participants uh, that will participate in the process, in this long process, is of essence because we don't want participants that have nothing to contribute. We don't have, we don't want participants that will not contribute. We don't want participants that will jump out from the, uh, the, the process uh, just about, let's say, two sessions and they will, and they will not attend anymore the, the, uh, the meetings. So this is of essence to send a carefully send the participants. I think the most challenging issue is uh, taking the team members from hesitation, either objection to cooperation. It's very easy to explain. Whenever you approach these kind of the team members, project manager, senior project manager, or, or, or even junior project manager, they would say to themselves, okay, in this situation, I have to reveal everything. I have to kind of uh, say everything. I might not have this kind of confidence on these consultants that are taking this information, what is going to be done by this information. And moreover, if I will reveal the information, someone may blame me and say, this is your own fault, this is not a risk, this is something that you haven't done yet. So it's very hard to harness these people and to make them believe that this process, they can reveal everything and they should, because this is the basis of the whole process. The Monte Carlo is kind of a garbage in, garbage out. Identifying the risk is the main heart of the, the heart of the project. And without cooperation from the team members, we can easily say that uh, it, might, it might fail. Judith? Yes, yeah, so um, maybe have a few words about the Israeli culture for those of you who don't, uh, who don't know Israelis. So Israeli teams have less sense, I would say, of hierarchy, and they are more open and blunt. This is surprisingly uh, serves well the process, although the project manager has some of a ruling veto we, we find that the discussion was pretty fluent and open and all members uh, participated quite well in the process. On the other hand, we do see another issue that is uh, the tendency to minimize issue, to, to ignore sometimes their severity and to round corners. In this case, our role as facilitators in the process was to induce these issues and to see if there is more hidden behind it. And um, additional issue is, uh, well, it was quite good, surprisingly. Uh, we already discussed how, uh, how eye-opening this uh, process was and how some of the members uh, found it enchanting and uh, waiting for the, for the next discussion. Uh, particularly, I think, the project manager who saw it as an opportunity to discuss those issues. Uh, and, and I think that the process incentivizes uh, um, all the participants to, um, to have an open, uh, true discussion about these issues and, and to make decision-making uh, more a methodology um, rather than something you just, you know, um, uh, just think about without, uh, just do without thinking. So what are our main insights? We've counted four of them. If 
we want to bring or create value for the organization, then taxpayers' money is of essence. You know, many organizations, many performing entities would want to deliver just because of the cutting ribbon by the minister or because they are pushed by the Ministry of Transportation and Finance, just get it done. Uh, by, by utilizing the Monte Carlo and pricing it, it's the, the taxpayer money is much more, uh, let's say, tangible and they, are, they feel much more accountable and responsible for the taxpayer money. This by itself, it's, uh, it's an achievement. As for bias, behavioral economics, and agent theory, they all play a role. This is not a sin, this is not a fault, this is not a flaw, this is not a problem, and this is not kind of a deficiency. This is us, this is the way that we behave. Two weeks ago, we have a, a, a discussion with the CEO of one of the, uh, these performing entities. And whenever we presented these issues of bias, behavioral economics, and venture theory, he said, yes, it is. We are biasing results always. This is the DNA of the human being to bias, to be. There is no kind of, there is no human being that can say, I am objective. There is no such a thing. And why are we are saying that? Because the scenarios should be built based on the fact that we have bias, we have behavioral economics, we have the agent theory playing the role within the project management in this team, and the scenario should take on account these uh, phenomena without saying that this is a problem. Yes, we could easily say, um, summarizing this uh, webinar, or, uh, in a minute we will summarize this uh, the webinar, that the uh, decision making was achieved and we've created the value for the organization, either by taxpayers' money much more accountable, either by assisting them with the decision-making regarding the contingency, and I'm quoting what the uh, CEO was saying, we need this process because it enhances our performance. Judy? Yeah, so I think it's very important that uh, we challenge ourselves. Uh, I, as you can see, we didn't, uh, in some of the processes, we didn't follow a certain cookbook. We had to improvise. We had to follow an unwalked path. And I, and I think it was worth a while. We think it was worth a while. First of all, it served the client. As Yehuda mentioned before, it elicited a professional discussion and helped support, it, support the decision. And second, we learned a few new things, and that's, that's always good. So thank you for joining us. Uh -huh.